working experience in local government and city government, um, you know, directly for, for nearly five years, but had a lot of communications and contact with people at state government level. And to a certain degree, um, something that Terry Moran was very keen on, the city's expert advisory panel, which was advising COAG. And in that process, I, learned, I, I got to know a lot of very senior and not so senior public servants um, for whom I have the most enormous respect and regard. They, you know, they or you, in the case of a lot of people in this room, really do a remarkable job, often underneath, uh, under a huge amount of pressure, especially time pressure. And, um, and I think that, especially when things are very pushed and frantic, I think that the obligation to speak to truth to power is at its most compromised, but it's actually a time when it's never more important. You mentioned time pressure. You talked, uh, I think you've talked anyway, about what's referred to as a sort of public policy um, triangle, a trade triangle, uh, which time is one factor and cost and quality are the others. Yeah, so it's, not it's not actually a concept in public administration. It probably is, but I, I came across it in my, you know, as a, in dealing with architects and um, city planning. And a great architect who's a great friend of mine who's actually the dean of, um, of the building environment at University of New South Wales, Alex Dennis, said, what you need to know about our civil projects is that there are three legs of a triangle and you can only ever get, get at, at best two at once. That's uh, time, cost and quality. You can you can get things done quickly, but you're lucky to be if you do if you if you push the envelope on speed, you're lucky to get quality and it's going to cost you a lot of money. Sometimes you can get quality but it's going to cost you a lot of money. But there are three key variables of which at any given time you can only have one only have two and sometimes only have one if if you really push people. And I think that sometimes I think we've learned uh, recently with certain things I don't want to be political at all here. Life but, insulation. Uh, yeah, life insulation. insulation. Exactly, that's a classic one. And that final chapter in the in that report is actually very, very revealing about uh, what happens when people are uh, operating under huge time constraints. But I think there's actually a fantastic book which I read late last year, um, which isn't available in hard copy yet here in Australia, but it's called The Blunders of Our Governments, written by Anthony King and Ivor Pruitt. It's a British publication. And this may be an editorial um, advisory comment for you, Tom and, and Jason, but it would be fantastic for there to be an Australian new version of The Blunders of Our Government, because they, they went through several, I mean, some people might have read it on Kindle or something, but several key blunders. And, and what what the ingredient is that triggers the greater risk of blundering is that is that if if you have a situation where you're making a decision, whether it's policy or program or delivery, whatever it is, it's essential to have the right people in the room and to keep the wrong ones out of the room, which often can be hard in politics. Um, you keep the people out of the room who have no relevant knowledge or, ex or experience, and often they can actually be quite noisy. Um, the people in the room have to have all the available facts before them, before them to make a decision, and they have to be free to challenge the decisions and argue about issues. And then, um, possibly uh, most uh, important, most importantly, in the case of the um, uh, home insulation program, the decisions need to be recorded and disseminated. So you need to have, I mean, probably in the home insulation program case, all of those, all of those rules were breached according to the Royal Commission report. And I think that what we need to make sure of in Australia that that never recurs. I mean, it often, it often will occur, but for all of them to, to be deficient at the same time is, is quite an achievement. As someone who's, who's worked in Canberra for, for many years, and I do do a lot of work which is public sector related myself, and, uh, and, I, and I recall a thought that I had many years ago when I went to graduate business school, and the thought that occurred to me was that when you look at successful companies, uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot of differences, obviously, with, with um, the public sector. But one of the fundamental uh, tenets of, of effective management is that responsibility and authority should reside at the second level. And almost inevitably, um, within not just public sector bureaucracies, but bureaucracies generally, public and private sector, uh, responsibility resides below the level of authority. 
Now, uh, that obviously introduces a whole lot of factors which are not necessarily positive. There's other, obviously, check factors that might, might be positive. But I'm wondering, is that an issue that you dealt with or that you were concerned about that you came across yourself in terms of your own experience? I think, um, I think that in business, the accountabilities are clearer to, easier to identify. And um, it's, it's much easier in business to find out who's really making the decisions and who's really doing the work. I think um, my, my own observation, which as I said isn't direct, it's indirect, is that sometimes it's hard to see where the decisions are being made or how they're being arrived at or who's actually doing, doing the decision making further down the organisation or the, I guess the agenda setting. And I think that you know, the public service um, operates um, with, you know, because it, it's a massive organisation, it operates where those accountabilities and, and who's doing what isn't always clearly understood. And you have this kind of um, situation which you never have in business that the people who are, you know, your political masters are, are the ones that are solely responsible for championing things. I think in businesses you have a, a wider range of people championing the business case or the proposal of what's needed to be done. So that's why I think it's really important for the visibility and the and the and the voice of uh, public servants to be louder and more clearly understood. And that's what's great about this magazine. That, that this publication is not really a magazine; it's a publication. To, so that actually the discussion, the deliberations that public servants in their daily life have to consider can be can be more clearly understood and, and articulated. Uh, before I uh, go to uh, Tom and Jason, just, just one further. I'm going to open uh, a question up to the floor too. We have a roving microphone, so I will swivel around and if there's anyone over there who would actually like to ask a question, perhaps you could indicate in the interim uh, to a young lady just over my shoulder there that uh, if you'd like a question uh, and we'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, but let me just say um, there are a couple of uh, retired Americans in this room that I've known uh, from the early days, in, in fact not just the early days, but certainly from earlier days uh, here in Canberra. Uh, and I do recall when the press club in its earlier days was in fact somewhere where on a Thursday and Friday night you couldn't move in the bar upstairs and on a Friday night particularly John Stone and his acolytes, David Morgan and others would, um, would turn up for a um, a hearty discussion and uh, John would, would engage in considerable debate and I think there was only one time that I can, and I engaged in a lot of those, with him as a young and enthusiastic journalist at the time, uh, I think there was only one time and I really ever got the better of him in the sense that he didn't have an answer and that was how do you replace what the private sector has as the, if you like, the benefit of the profit motive. Uh, what do you replace that with in the public sector? I mean, we've tried, obviously, with you know people being paid a bit of extra at the end of every, every year, which really just became an assumption you get paid at regardless. Um, is there anything that you can, any replacement for that in terms of motivation and focus in the public sector, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, clearly what the public service does is often outstanding, usually outstanding. Um, um, and whenever they aren't outstanding, it's important to, to take stock. But I think the question of how you reward and motivate people is a very, very real one. And you don't have any market forces determining whether you've you know, made a profit or haven't made a profit. You're absolutely right. But I think the best way of actually achieving um, you know, pride in, in what you're doing and motivating people and getting recognition for people is for the role of what they do to be more clearly understood. I think, you know, bonuses are all very good, but I think that a lot of people in the public service are not in it purely for the money. Um, that in, in a management sense, but also in a public sense, the recognition of the work that they do is really, is really, is, is much more important than has been given weight to. So. I think I'd like to see a situation where you don't need a Royal Commission to find out what went wrong. Or, you know, it would be good if taking stock could happen more at a, at a more, you know, public level without having a Royal Commission on the one hand. But you need to be, you need to have greater visibility of when great things happen. And great things do happen, it's just that we never find out about them. But I hope that the Mandarin um, brings those more clearly to life. So let me go to, to, to Tommy. Well, 
Uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that, Glenn. I'll, I'll, we might just have a bit of a chat with Tom and, and Jason. And I'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for that. Happy to. If, I'm not sure if you're the first to put your hand up or not, or, or the microphone's already moved, or it's gone somewhere else. I'll find that out in a minute. But, uh, Tom, um, uh, of course, I'll just go back to the point I was raising before. The short-term profit motive in the private sector can often be very damaging to a company's performance, in fact, as it's pursued to the detriment of the company's longer-term performance. But presumably you've got a bit of a short-term profit motive in terms of getting the mandarin up and running. So... Um, <coughs> Where are you focused? I mean, obviously, this is a focus of the private sector, and obviously, it requires uh, corporate support. So, you know, how has all this come together, and how's it going to come together over the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, one, I think, getting the, the, as we call it, the product right. So, it, we've got a big um, promise to try and cover the public sector in a sensible, respectful, reasonable way. Now, the fact, I don't find that so hard because having worked in and out of it over many times and, you know, many people here, it's a very professional game, Australia's public sector. You know, it makes mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes, you know. And if we can learn from them, then the better. You know, the NDIS, you know, is probably opposed to told us how to do it, you know. And a lot of people have held that up as, you know, a, a good, sharp articulation of the problem, build consensus around the solution, and by the time it got into the political system, it was like a laid out was it. So you know, there are lots of good examples, and there's some others where it doesn't. Now, you know, we're all human beings, and we're all working with real problems. And, you know, Australia are very blessed with some very professional um, people. So it's not as if you're covering a train wreck here. I think you're covering some very interesting work. One of the things I've really noticed is, um, you know, a lot of states are dealing with very similar problems. You know, Victoria's just building or just proposing to bring in a one-punch rule. Well, New South Wales have now had three to six months experience on that. Yeah. And so we can share those experiences back and forward. Yeah, a lot of that sort of, if you like, just sharing the, the professional propositions that are in public sector. Um, there's some very big picture issues. Um, you know, the design of public service, and I think that's definitely up for challenge. And I think, you know, it's been a pretty much a stable model for probably 50 years. But, you know, these days when you can Google someone and, you know, um, you know Malcolm, I think he's here, he just text, you know, the head of Microsoft and he gets the answer. So what's the role of an advisory department in that? Uh, my suspicion that's very different from what it is at the moment. So budgets are travelling south. I mean, now that environment is changing the way people need to work. And then I think there's a huge revolution happening in the service delivery side. One of the things that struck me coming into this job is how that's become so much more important these days. So the actual delivery at the front end has become much more an issue these days. And in fact, a lot of the sharpest thinkers, I think, have now moved to that space and are starting to think, well, how we deliver that. Mm -hmm. And the digital piece definitely mm -hmm. becomes a big play in that. Mm -hmm. So, and interestingly, as you open that up, you know, because it is a, an assumption that you'll deliver government in a very different way, all of a sudden you've got some very interesting private players who can bring things to that table. And that's hopefully the, dis the, uh, the discussion we can engage people with. It's not an easy thing, you know. It's not an easy thing to understand the public proposition. It's not an easy thing to then manage the market to, uh, uh, if you like, respond to that proposition. And that all takes a lot of sophistication, you know, and but that's where the model's moving, you know. There's a massive opportunity if we together can manage that in a very mature, break it some sense and really get some solutions. We've seen it in, in the employment services, we're seeing it in some of the disability areas, we're building those economies. But this is a big paradigm shift. And I think if the mandarin can be the piece in the middle, just making that a sensible, ongoing, re respectful conversation, then I think we'll make it work. Mm -hmm. Lucy, you, you want to yeah, I was talking to some, add something about the importance of, of having a comparative understanding of what other places are doing, whether it's other states or other countries. And there was a great article in The Economist on the 9th of August saying, which was headlined, Modernising the Mandarins. And it was, it was talking about a woman called Jocelyn Bourgon, who runs an organisation called New Synthesis, which is a project that has convened six countries. Brazil, Britain, Canada, the Netherlands, New Zealand and Singapore to share approaches to thorny subjects such as welfare reform. Now I think that you know it would be very, very good if the Mandarin and, and, and the uh, public service could you know, get on board with that because it sounds like a really good project because comparative understanding of what other people are doing is a very good way of, of road testing what you'd like to do yourself. So it's that that's a key issue which I think sometimes doesn't work. When I was doing the city's um, um, expert panel work with Brian Howe, who was um, the, the chair of it, we had a couple of forums where we had planning, people from planning departments of all the states around Australia 
And that was actually a revelation for, for all of us because suddenly all these planners who were de grappling with the same problems were actually saying to each other, I didn't know we were dealing with the same problems as you guys were. And, and it's, it's a pity that that doesn't happen more. Uh, Jason, I want to come to you in terms of the content, but before I do that, um, I'll just go back to Tom. Now, um, if uh, half a dozen people just walked through the, the door, they hadn't been, they hadn't heard anything of what uh, has been said prior to this moment, what in a nutshell would you say to them about what's in it for them in terms, what's, you know, in, as far as the manner is concerned and why should they be engaged? Coverage of a sector of the Australian economy that's somewhere between a quarter to a third, depending how you want to manage and measure it. So here's a very sophisticated space where a lot of things happen and we want to cover it in a way um, that really gives people insight. You know, we talk as a team, you know, how we cover it. And we say, look, think about it like sport. We say, you could be covering it for an audience. No, we're not covering it for sports lovers. You could be covering it for the players. No, you're not covering it for the players. We're covering it for the coaches. We're trying to reach that sophisticated level. That's a big challenge for us to do. But I think if we can address and talk at that sort of sophisticated public administration level, then I think the audiences will come together. Um, and we've seen already in six weeks, I've launched a lot of websites, we've involved a lot of publications. The, the feedback has been tremendous. You know, and it's not all public, by the way, which is great. You know, we're always happy to take other things. But in general, I'm fairly go out for this. You know, it's not as if you sort of launch and you're waiting for people to turn up. You know, we've got tremendous people wanting to write for us, great interest in what it is, curiosity. Uh, you know, length on site which you could you know die for in other environments that tells you people are sticking and thinking and lots of response you know and that's a terrific sort of starting point. Well Jason from your point of view as the editor who's going to be driving that content um, I mean So there were a couple of things, and, and we said this from the outset too, I, I think what we want to be about is the practice of, of public sector work um, and, and also the professional development side as well. We said from the outset that we can't be everything to everyone, we're not going to be a definitive guide to every portfolio, every department, every agency, every jurisdiction, um, but we think that there is good work happening out there that can be instructive to everyone whether they're in a state system, whether they're in a federal department, whether they're in an agency, whether they're in a, a local uh, grassroots level. Um, we think that the story about the, the massive restructure of the federal department might be as instructive to someone as the case study of a, of a community program that, that benefits uh, dozens of people as opposed to thousands and, and millions of people. So we very much want to be about the practice and, and we think we can really capture the attention of everyone who works in this space by having a really uh, strong focus on, on, on that side. Now, the, you know, one of the points here is, of course, it, it's, it's covering the public sector in Australia. It's, it's not a federal... The, the, Tom's made that point, you just alluded to that point. How do you plan to get that coverage uh, you know, across all the territories, essentially, states and territories, I mean by that, obviously? Yeah, sure, and, and, and we're not everywhere, um, and, and we're very much reliant on building relationships and we've started that over the last few weeks to, to make sure that we are talking to the right people and make sure that we've got the right channels in place and, and we have a great advantage in the digital space obviously that it is so easy for people to talk to us um, to make sure that we have those channels in place where people can talk to us and, and what we're saying to everyone who works in this space is, is please do talk to us. We, we use the word venue and um, we do want to be the space that people come to to congregate and, and talk about uh, what they're working on um, and hopefully capture, I mean, we, we, we think I guess that there's some, you know, there's a lot of light under bushels in, uh, mm -hmm. in this sector and we think that, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a space here to really profile and shine a light on the good work and hopefully we can ferret out a lot of that but hopefully a lot of people will, will tell us as well. It might not be in the character perhaps of mm -hmm. public servants to to do that. We'll be doing our very best to tease it out and uh, as I say, whether it is in the state system, the federal system, throughout this entire profession, um, to, to shine a light on, on good work. 
Okay, let's let's have the floor now. Now I'm not too sure where the microphone's gone. Is it gone? We, we've got a question over here from uh, Glenn Mill, so I'll take uh, anyone else out there with a question. At this stage, no, no hands gone up. Go Thanks ahead. very much, Laurie. I, it's a question that um, can be addressed to all the panel if they choose. Um, I know that sections of this government are planning, and I believe some are already putting into practice, uh, in their red tape camp and cut red tape, to actually incentivise public servants within the department with pay and condition rewards for finding red tape and cutting it. Now, does that manifest itself to you as a corruption of the system or is it a smart application of private sector ideas to the public sector? I'd like to respond to that. I, I think initially you wanted to ask a question of Lucy, so was it um, initially directed at her? Um, yeah, I, listen, if, if there's no, if there's nothing like eye packable about it, I mean, I think it's a good idea to incentivise people as long as, as long as people are very clear about what the, what the, what people are seeking to do. So if you have senior managers or I think often the, a lot of the time the, the um, ideas can actually come from the front desk. Um, you know, the, the, the interface where people actually interface with, um, with citizens and I think actually motivating and, and encouraging them to come up with ideas for saving time and expense is actually a very good idea as long as it's not seen as being the step before they get the sack all the time. I mean, you've got to actually motivate them through encouragement rather than through fear. But if you motivate people to, to um, think of innovative ways of transforming the way things are done, then that's got to be a fantastic thing. And I think that one of the, the canards about the public service is that it doesn't have a sufficient culture of innovation. Now, I think that's not always true. But if you incentivise and motivate people to innovate, that's a wonderful thing. OK, any other questions out there? No, I don't see anyone putting their hand up. Let, let me... I'll let me... pick up that question. Too. Yeah, that's right, Tanya. So I think, look, part of these are a remuneration question, but I don't think it's really the answer in my observation. Yeah, to be frank, public servants at the senior end are paid pretty well. Um, so it's not enough, you know, people aren't being underpaid. Uh, they work very hard for it, so I'm not saying that. Uh, so I don't really feel it's a remuneration issue. Um, I do feel we've worked a bit of a, a uh, gridlock around, if you like, the highly politicised environment we're in at the moment, the way media's, in a sense, gone off down its own channel. Social media's got everyone spooked. And so you're not getting this sort of, you know, if you like, relationship between the executive level of government and the administrative level of government that perhaps, you know, when John Stone was up here, although I do recall, I think Paul Keating was the one who said he had to talk Stone into the to regulation of the dollar. But there's more of an alignment between the executive level of government and the administrative level. And I feel at the moment everyone's spooked by this high level of contention and particularly the social media piece. And we issues, you know, it's very difficult to frame up issues at all. You know. And you know, whether you're trying to do something small like you know, change a hospital or something bigger like a railway line or something even bigger like an NBN, then you, know, you really have to have your act together you know, to make that happen these days. And I don't think the system's mature enough at this stage to do it. I think we're all struggling to make that transition. Um, and that's not the point fingers at anyone, but if we can get that alignment, then I think you've got a chance to rethink things. You know. And then the system's you know, allowing us to do that. We've got a lot of you know, uh, digital change. You know, ben out here at the DHS is doing some really interesting work uh, in the sort of what I call the heavy end of industrial delivery. Yeah. And the whole my gut exercise is a really interesting play. You know. And that opens up all sorts of avenues for us. We've just got to get ourselves through this process now. And I'm hoping, it's probably naive on my behalf, I'm going to be, I've been accused of that before, um, that if we can just give people a sensible place where they can discuss these things, get a more reasoned discussion, lower the temperature, get people being respectful of our ideas, and then we can start moving through this, what's going to be a very exciting stage. You know, it's a really interesting stage for Australia now. We're standing at a very important pivot. We've got that terrific opportunity of the middle class of Asia. We've got globalisation on our doorstep. We don't have distance as an issue. You know, if we make all those come together, then I think we've got a you know a really good opportunity, and that's where I hope the Mandarin can play its role. Mm. Okay, I'll tell you, I'm not on phone. Yeah. Um, the devil's deal seems to be that you can talk to power as long as you don't talk to anybody else. And one of the salient <laughs> transformations of the public service yeah. uh, over the past thirty to forty years has been that the the uh, 
I guess you could say, the cowder within the senior ranks of talking about, not, not leaking, but talking about decisions which they are implementing. And that's produced a lack of detail, a lack of uh, uh, supporting argument uh, that some of the political masters can't provide. Uh, now, will the Mandarin encourage more transparency? Will the Mandarin encourage public servants to speak more to humble hacks? <laughs> it's an interesting question because one that most people ask me actually is, well, how are you going to get the public sector, which is quite risk averse at the moment, for the reason we just talked about, to come out? And I said, look, they're already very public. You know, there are lots of public programs. You know, I came from a place where they had a very big cyber safety program, a great program, right? Uh, they did a very nice piece of work around spectrum reform, etc. So these are already public programs. You know. And then you've got people giving speeches, people giving presentations. Now, not everyone's ready to jump yet, uh, but if we just play in the spaces people are already public and give people a confidence around that, then, you know, just because I happen to have drunk the cool, I don't know, once you get into that space, you get a bit more confidence, then you don't mind, you know, fronting up and having a chat to Malcolm, you know, and you don't mind start discussing things because you've got a confidence and ability to do it, and you realise that, you know, that out there, you can, can manage this environment. Um, and that's certainly my learning in this space, that as, as contentious as noisy it is, it's much better to be in there managing it and trying to discuss things and engaging than not, because not really t t sends you back into the dark ages. And my frank view, that's just gone. You know, we've got to move into this new era. And so if we can be a, a, a vehicle, among others, uh, to help people build that confidence and engagement, then that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure who the next question is for, but it's from Mr. Turnbull over there. So. Well, 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 thank you. Um, this is Tony Jones like. You may prefer to take this as a comment rather than a question. <laughs> and, uh, can, I, can I just make this suggestion, Tom, that I think that one of the great things you can do with this new publication is celebrate and reinforce innovation. Uh, one of the biggest problems in any organisation, whether it belongs to the government or, or the private sector, is having a culture where um, the penalties for failure, quote unquote, are vastly out of proportion to the rewards for success. And if you have that, you naturally, and then that is very common, I think, in the public service, that you naturally have a, um, a an incentive for any rational actor to do nothing, uh, and to be very, very cautious, or to be very cautious if they ever do anything. Um, as we operate in a much more volatile and much more dynamic and much more rapidly changing environment, experimentation is very important. It is critically important, and I, if I can give you one bit of encouragement and feel free to comment on it, I think what you should do is uh, pick up what Lucy says about identifying what's being done in other jurisdictions. That is a huge failure in our public service culture. The public service is vastly less aware of what's happening in other jurisdictions than, say, the private sector is. But above all, you know, celebrate, reward, um, you know, recognise innovation because because the fact is, unless we try new things, we've got to try new things. And if you try new things, a lot of them won't work. But so what? You know, and if you if you smash people because they try something and it doesn't work, then they'll never try anything new again. So I think that that's a big, a really big cultural change. And if, you know, if the Mandarin, which I know observe is not a Chinese word, but a Portuguese word, just for the etymologists in the room. Uh, but, the, uh, but if the Mandarin can, um, can do that, it will have really made a gigantic contribution to the improving the standard of government in Australia. I'm happy to take that uh, as an invitation for a response, actually. Uh. <laughs> so um, there's an argument whether it's Portuguese, by the way, but we're going to offline. So look, it is a, it's a big challenge, you know, and mainly not the only answer, but hopefully it's partly that answer. Um, yeah, the innovation piece, Jason did a really nice piece on Mike Pratt, who came from NAB, uh, to help uh, deliver service New South Wales, you know, an issue that took, you know, dozens and dozens of officers doing roads and other pieces of service to be brought it all together. And then you can imagine the back end issues around that, you know, and what, are, you know, and there hasn't, you know, it hasn't been all roses, there's been a lot of issues, but, but talking about that, 
the issue and then talking about Mike Pratt and the sort of person he is and the things he's learned about, it's exactly that sort of thing. You know. So the more we can create heroes, you know, when I went to the public sector back in the 80s, it was a bit best and brightest. I'm not saying I was. I think I sneaked in the back door. But it was. There's a real sense of, you know, Ravi and Larry and others were here and you had a sense of dynamism. And I think we've lost a bit of that. Uh, so if we can get that back, Phil Clark's here, who was part of that crowd. Um, and so there's a real sense you came and you really put in. You know. So I think getting you know, different energy levels as part of that, um, recognising heroes and then celebrating successes and, that, and not demonising failures. Um, and at the moment, I think that's the issue we've got right at the moment. It's a very contentious space. Before I go to Mark's rolling on the floor, I just want to pick up on the things Malcolm said, particularly about... Um, sharing, that's something you've alluded to earlier. Uh, for the IT people in the room, I presume you've probably got some, there's always a few around. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a body called the CJ, CJ, CAIC, I think it is, uh, cross jurisdictional uh, information uh, technology commission or something. Uh, so the chief information is a committee. No, it's, it's a national, it's basically all the jurisdictions and New Zealand, uh, the, the, the chief um, uh, information officers from each, uh, each organisation. And, and uh, there was a meeting at the big CBIT conference in Sydney, which you'd know well about, that, yeah. that happens every year, the IT conference. Um, and I chaired a meeting of that uh, earlier this year. Now, they all talked about the importance of sharing, but the mentality, which they all admitted was a problem, was that they wanted to, they wanted to know what you were doing, but they didn't want to tell you what they were doing. And so they didn't really, you know, they, it wasn't a two-way flow. And there's a, a recognition and acknowledgement that this was a problem they had to overcome, but it wasn't just, even if they wanted to do it, it was a question of getting approval upstairs to be able to share that stuff. So... I guess what I'm really getting at is the, the importance here and, and how you might somehow contribute to that level of sharing. I mean, if you can get that information out there from another jurisdiction to all of the other jurisdictions around the country, that's obviously going to be of value, but it's a question of driving that and how you see that being driven, Tom. Yeah, I think it is, and I think it's probably two levels. There's within the uh, jurisdictions themselves, but we've got... Um, you know, that's where the partner content model uh, comes in. It's a very interesting model. You know, it's essentially saying, look, there's a lot of brainiacs out there you know, working around government, helping government, a lot, lot of them in this room. And we can bring those into that discussion and make that a better discussion. Then that starts to lead down that innovation piece that Malcolm and Lucy were talking about. Um, so we really hope to uh, work with uh, you know, sophisticated people who are looking to really have deep relationships with government but also happy to share that. Um, and that's the new way of the world, share these things. Um, so at the moment, we've got some of the leading consultant firms, hoping to get some of the banks, uh, working with some of the legal firms. Yeah. And these are people who have very strong relations. The technology companies you know, bring a lot to this space. Yeah. And so if we can mine out from those um, and you know, present back into this audience and then let them collaborate, then that, I think, is a very powerful opening up of the system. Um, and our hope is that by you know, really bringing that sort of DNA and uh, a new DNA in, it'll, it'll help that innovation piece um, and open up the conversations and also build the trust relationships. And so our partner model is really built around that. Mm. We're getting close to, to wrapping up, but I'll take a question from Morris Riley. We, we often see uh, politicians taking the credit or throwing big bats, big bats uh, about... Um, federalism, you know, the COAG process, uh, but we don't see a lot about, you know, the people behind COAG and the public servants. So do you think you'll, any, the Mandarin will focus on work that's done by, um, you know, I mean, federalism can only work if the, the bureaucrats are in all the states and territories. Um, you know, it's, it's a story that, you know, nothing's often written about, and I wonder whether that's a, that's a vein of uh, information you should be uh, reporting on. For sure, and yeah, we are trying to get behind. Yeah, we're interested in the how and the why, as, as Jason said. So, and yeah, the administration of these issues. Yeah, how we put together the MH17 rescue plan. Yeah, very interesting work. We're going to revisit that hopefully because I think there's a lot more in it. What were the lessons we learned? And if we can go back and say, well, there's obviously a lot of work put into it. Uh, Australia's done quite a lot of that work now. What are we trying to do? So, if we can bring to life who those people are. And then, um, in their own way, tell their stories. Uh, and I think we, um, you know, got some. We just did a, a piece with Mary Ann Lockman, who's just been working in the mm. Coag Reform Council. She's outstanding. And she's done some really nice, yeah. interesting work. And her insights were really useful. Yeah. And there's a person who's quite happy to share it. Um, and it, it just made a nice piece. And it, it got a profile and. 
Um, and uh, so, yeah, the more we can, I think, humanise these things and not just make it an anonymous sort of exercise, the people get to understand, gee, there's a person behind that, there's a thought behind that brain. Mm. I think one of the interesting things, actually, the BCA has done recently is set up an interning program where, you know, 20 um, public servants can be interned in, in you know, BCA, in inside the businesses of BCA members. And I think that's fantastic, but I think it would be good if it was if it was a reciprocal thing as well, so that people working in businesses could go and work in the public service. Because I actually think that each has a lot to learn. You probably hate that, but, but each, has a, each has a lot to learn about the other. I mean, it's, it's a good way of, it's like exchange students, really. But it's, you know, there's something to be said for that cross, Cross fertilisation at a, at a sort of like at a at an organisational level. Yeah, and they're definitely um, Tony Blunt here. Tony was my first secretary. Um, I'm so pleased to have him here. Now, yeah, it was a simpler time, I think, perhaps. <laughs> but I, I remember at the time, um, yeah, we engaged very strongly as a housing industry, um, really brought the housing industry together. There was a real issue around housing startups, yeah, and so there was a confidence about that engagement. Um, and so I think getting that confidence back into the system and being able to tackle these problems that are very real um, and do it as a team rather than as a sort of, you know, one side public, one side public, private, um, is a much better way to go. And as Australia, we just can't afford to have, you know, these sort of segregated communities. Mm. You know. We're 20 million people strong and we're up against some very big economies. And if we're going to back against our way in the same way, we um, play sport, and we've just got everything working for us. You know, at the moment we're splintering off into these small camps, and so if we can bring those together, that's a great thing. I saw the microphone going in that direction. I'm not sure if it went to someone. No, it doesn't look like it has. Let me just, uh, I'll oh, Terry. Yes, please. I'll take a question from Terry. Could I make a comment on Malcolm's comment? <coughs> I don't entirely <laughs> agree with what he said because if you look at innovation in the public sector more Sorry, generally. I'm about to modify your view in, in that sense. Um, I want a full-throated disagreement. <laughs> okay, you can have it. Um, I think I think that. Robust advocacy that you have to do for Kevin Rush. Thanks, that's terrific. Um, in our system of government, there's a lot of innovation in the public sector, but it tends to be in agencies and institutions that have a lot of devolved authority and their own governance arrangements. Think public hospitals, schools, TAFEs, the Reserve Bank. Um, the public sector is not departments of state. And if you look for innovation in departments of state, you'll be disappointed because innovation declines the closer you get to a minister. You're, you're an exception, I'm sure, but frankly, <laughs> the secret of risk aversion lies in Parliament House. Yeah. <laughs> we agree on that. The, the secret of, uh, of innovation is not to be found in Parliament House, it's to be found in devolved institutions within the public sector that have the authority to do things differently and better. And actually, that history of innovation is well recognised overseas in Australia, but not so much uh, in Australia itself. So, so you're right about departments of state, which is what ministers work with. You're wrong about 90% of the public sector. I'm happy to, to follow up on that and, and for anyone to, to comment on what Terry said, but I, but I want to throw into the mix as well. Uh, you know, I do because I do do a lot of consulting in the public sector. I do commonly find, well, I'm not saying every day, but 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 uh, certainly often over many years, uh, people uh, in the middle ranks saying, you know, we're encouraged to take risks, but we're told don't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a it's a, it's a classic catch-22. I mean, you can't be encouraged to take yeah. risks that's with the benefit. Unfair. That's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> the critical thing you've got to do is get the right expectations so that when the journalist says, can you guarantee that this program will work, you've got to have the courage and the integrity to say, no, I don't, I can't guarantee that it will work. Can you guarantee this is future proof? No, nothing is future proof. You've got to get across to people that we are living in an age of immense volatility. Okay, and therefore you have to be nimble and you have to be innovative. And, and you know, the, I, I think part of the problem is that we're, you know, is that, is that the real world is out there 
volatile, changeable, unpredictable. And yet in the public sector, and on politicians, I take Terry's criticism, politicians are, you know, prime culprits who this in almost every other field of this species. But the, but, the, but the politicians are always trying to assure people that everything is going to be right. And that's what I'm saying to you, Tom, that if you can promote innovation and celebrate innovation, and, and you know, and basically you learn more from things that don't work than you do from things that work. And, you know, we've got to, I mean, the great example is what the UK have done with their government digital services, which is run like a startup. You go in there, it looks, you feel like you walked in to a startup in, you know, in Silicon Valley or something. I mean, it's a completely different culture. And the public service can be in it, but you've got to, you know, you need politicians to to endorse it. But I think, you know, with your influence, you can make a genuine, really transformative impact on on the nature of government in Australia by bringing it into that, into that volatile world into the real world, which is a volatile world where optionality, experimentation, innovation is at a premium. <clears throat> Yeah, well, look, I certainly agree with that. And, and certainly one of my lessons with uh, when I was working with Chris Chi and others at the ACMA was try and small the problem a bit. You know, I think too often we create the massive problem and then try and solve it. And these days, the world moves too quickly and we don't have the capability to solve it all. So if you can small it a bit and say, okay, if we're trying to fix up, you know, say my gut, trying to get that authentication and identity piece working, very tricky. You know, and uh, we've got to sort of just chunk that out and chunk that out and chunk that out. And in my world, it's incredibly you know, volatile in proposition. No one quite knows how to work out digital identity. So we've got to accept the uncertainty that Malcolm talks about. So we are going to try and pick up those nuances um, and try and understand. I think infrastructure is obviously another space. You know, how can we deliver infrastructure in a better, more market oriented way? Uh, I think no one's claiming the last 30 years has been brilliant. We've learned some things, we've done some things differently, we've privatised a lot of things. So really trying to get an interest in that infrastructure space. And so working with some big partners in that space will help us deepen our proposition. And so we're looking for partners you know, who have a deep interest in infrastructure. And the, you know, the rules have changed quite decisively in the last uh, year or so. And so there's a real opportunity to rethink in that space, for example. Uh, and that makes real differences to people's lives. So. If there's uh, no further question, I'm going to just ask one final question myself. Anyone there got a question now? Mm. All right. Um, uh, yeah, okay. John. <laughs> just one. Um, probably for Tom, and it's an unfair question perhaps to end the evening on. Uh, Tom, as you know, because you took part in it, we held a, a national, nationally networked Gov Camp in six cities, and it was on Innovation Minister uh, with a couple of hundred people. The interesting the interesting thing is that I'd, I'd like to make the observation on is that your venture is a child of the digital age. And the digital age means that we're more connected than some of us want to believe. It's quite threatening to some. How are you going to use digital to communicate the new era to the people who need to accept that it's, it's here now? Oh, by providing hopefully an environment that can do that in a safe and reasoned way. You know, just putting a speech in and perhaps you know, opening it up for comments is a good starting point. You know, it sounds like a, a really naff thing to do, but that is a good thing to do. You know, perhaps a blog where you have to think about something and do something. You know, perhaps even just a video. Often, you know, I find in this space, you know, a real expert talking for two minutes can be a lot more than words can. So if we can just work in those sort of spaces. Um, and there's an awful lot of public process that goes on, consultations and reports and uh, various things that come out all the time. And so there's no shortage of material. So if we can encourage people to put that work together, perhaps to put you know, one bit more effort to talk about it publicly, even if it's just a written piece or a, you know, something where they do something for 30 seconds to, uh, on YouTube or something, then I think that starts to get people out. The, the, really, the piece of, that surprised me actually is how strong the social piece is within government. This, three or four years ago it wasn't that strong, now it's very strong. And so we're getting a lot of um, uh, discussion within social circles, uh, within what I call professional government circles, 
that I wrote about you know four years ago where that, where that exists it certainly exists now and so for the if you like masters of the of the organization you know if you go along to these gov cap hack camps you find that's where your real innovation's happening you know mm. there's some really interesting work happening there mm. um, yeah in the trenches yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I, th I totally endorse what Tom says, but it's interesting in Singapore and some other parts of, you know, other, other government, um, government organisations actually use crowdsourcing to get good ideas and technology ideas. Now, that's, that, that is the complete opposite to the big technology project delivery model. But I think that you have to be nimble and you have to be flexible and, and you know, case studies and understanding of how, how things can work in another, in an, on another scale is actually really important to know about. Okay, we won't, uh, I think we might wrap it up on that point. Um, leave us some time for, oh, sorry, Tom, would you like to make a, a yeah, final Yeah, I'd like to say a big thank you. Uh, adventures like this are a huge team effort um, and they have been. Uh, a lot of you here have contributed to make it this. I mean that seriously. Most of you have been tapped in some way, and you've been, you know, our focus group, to be frank, uh, and we really respect that. We've got a lot of time and effort for our partners who are working with us, uh, but hopefully they're enjoying the journey, and we're certainly enjoying the journey with them. Um, and I feel those partners are getting a, a box seat ride on this exercise, so they're learning a lot about this whole approach as we are. And then very much a thanks to the private media team who've taken me in and Jason. And we've got a good team in Melbourne, a good team in Sydney, uh, marketing team and sales team, Lindsay's here as well. So these things don't happen by accident. Um, you know, media is a, uh, <laughs> media is a, is a problematic area as well now. And if we can pull this off and make it work, then I think everyone's a winner and I'm really hoping that can happen. So thank you all and very thankful to Officer Lucy and Noel as well. Thank you. Oh, I can take my thing off. I think I I'm gonna fix my gaze on you. I'm gonna fix my gaze on you. I'm gonna fix my gaze on you. Tell me what am I to do? You won't fix your gaze on me. I'm gonna fix my gaze on you. I'm gonna fix my gaze on you.